This is, in my opinion, the most crushing opening that you could possibly play against 1d4 if you find yourself anywhere below 1800 in uh, online chess. Now, whether you care about the opening at all or not, I would highly advise you to watch the whole video because uh, it's gonna help you out with something that I truly cannot value enough, which is dynamic chess. And trust me, this is not any rocket science. In the Grunfeld, you will have a bunch of repetitive thematic pawn sacrifices that are very intuitive because when you're going to be playing the opening, you're going to get a pretty obvious sense that, okay, if we don't have the usual active moves, we need to do something. It's like uh, you try to drive your car and you realize that, uh, oh, we forgot to turn on the engine. Then that means obviously in the Grunfeld, we probably have to sacrifice a pawn and activate our pieces. However, there's a catch. If you're trying to learn the Grunfeld by memorizing theoretical variations as a beginner, it probably won't really uh, help you very much just because of the fact that uh, people below 1800 online are genuinely clueless. So instead, what you need to focus on is um, thematic ideas, which is exactly what uh, we're going to be discussing in this video, because I'm going to be walking you through five model games that I have played against some intermediate players that I was able to find online. All right, everybody, back with another black game. Going to continue the Grunfeld saga. Going to try uh, knight f6, g6, and uh, hopefully we're going to see some c4, yeah? So here it is. Now, what's important to uh, remember as a Grunfeld player, you need to watch out for the move order. Because uh, you want to go knight f6, g6, and uh, you want to play d5 only when after cd5, knight takes d5, you can meet e4 with knight takes on c3 because otherwise you have to keep uh, the knight passive and uh, white gets the center you don't manage to trade a pair of knights which is crucial uh, in the Grunfeld otherwise you're just gonna be uh, worse in the long run so I'm gonna play bishop g7 waiting for knight c3 and only then we play d5 because on cd we can take with a knight okay Pony plays bishop to g5 where, uh, yeah, this is like a pretty nice uh, theoretical crossroads. Um, the old move and what we're going to play, I think the easiest as a general rule of thumb is to meet bishop g5 with knight e4. But just so you know, with computer analysis, they even made castling work. Because these kind of positions after bishop takes, bishop takes, uh, c takes on d5 and then both c6 or c5. Uh, with the point to meet dc with queen uh, a5 or knight d7 are leading to very interesting compensation for black but yeah gonna play the simple one knight e4 targeting the bishop i believe uh, now main line goes something like cd knight g5 knight g5 and then uh, uh, e6 i remember there is both knight f3 or queen d2 ed5 queen e3 check where you simply play king f8 and on knight e4 I feel like we're doing pretty well already because, yeah, white is immediately losing. So this is one of the reasons why I was thinking the Grunfeld can be such an uh, effective weapon against lower rated players. You don't really need to know like a thousand moves, like, uh, you know, just to understand all the main lines. It's just they quickly crack like this. I mean, 94, we just won five moves. He took decisive mistake. Uh, take on b2. Extra two pawns and monster bishop. Has to play rook b1 but take on a2. Keep grabbing. I could also play queen e5 targeting the bishop and keeping my pawn. Uh, but I think, uh, yeah. This one's even nicer because I've prepared a trick. I got a really nasty trick in case he goes for the most tempting move. So, important that queen a5 check does not win because the bishop is defended. Oops, I meant to say uh, this arrow. But if you start bishop f5, you're pinning. There's a very decent chance. Uh, here we go, bishop d3, I was assuming. And then I was thinking we can trick him, but maybe this is not as clever as I initially thought. <laughs> 
Okay, I was considering taking queen a5. And let's say he has to play king e2, because on queen d2 I can win his queen. But on king e2, if I take the bishop, there will be bishop takes b7 at the end, trapping my rook. So that part, I was not really... Uh, yeah, I wasn't really calculating, but okay. This is pretty crazy. I think we have very nice winning sequence here. We can just play knight c6. And the point is that, uh, well, we are threatening takes in queen a5. And that wins. But in case you would have played the rook takes on b7, pause the video and try to find the best move. Because I think by far... The most crushing move would have been Long Castle. Targeting the rook, targeting the bishop uh, with your rook, threatening bishop before. Probably he had to go queen b3, but then at the very least you can trade queens, uh, take on d3, take on e4 after, you got two pieces, then you can take on g2. That has to be like a disaster. So he castles. But I think he can do the same. Castle long. He doesn't really have a good way to unpin other than queen b3, but then uh, same trick will apply. And uh, yeah, this is big friend. So, 10 moves. Complete annihilation with the Grunfeld. Okay. Oh man. I kind of had the feeling that uh, games could go like this. That is why I uh, asked you about the Grunfeld in the previous video. <laughs> but oh man. I didn't really think that it's going to be uh, such a distraction. So, uh, yeah, white thinking, obviously looking for moves. Maybe he has to play f3, but even that's like losing. I think it has to be losing to something like 95, just putting pv on the pin. You got to put the pressure on the pin pieces. Okay, that is... Uh, Simple g4, he let his move, but uh, I can just take. <laughs> Opponent forgot about uh, the main issue with his position. There was a pin, but I, I think he was like so packed to the point where he had no move. So get a forless win against 1700 rated player. Go to 98. <laughs> just that simple. Uh, no brilliant moves. Losing move for him, definitely. Knight takes on e4 already. Move six, he's completely dead. Uh, yeah, he had to go um, CD5. And then I told you, it's important that you don't go for the temptation, okay? The temptation is takes and then queen D5. Because you're going to be worse after E3. White has this advanced, uh, I mean, disadvantage thanks to the pawns. This is like playable, kind of. But it's very nice to take the bishop and then play E6. Target the knight. He's going to go back most of the times, and then the point is to play c6. And quite a nice idea in these Grunfeld possessions is not to rush with castling, even though that works. But you can actually maneuver this bishop to d6 from what I remember, and then castle. Like for instance, e3, c6, bishop e2, let's say. And now something like bishop f8, I think it's quite nice. So you get like an active bishop. Maybe it wasn't in this very position due to e4, but yeah, keep that idea in mind because it's very nice. You can actually start knight f6. No matter how you play this uh, structure, you're going to be fine because essentially what's happening right now is you've got uh, an exchange version of the queen's gambit, uh, of the queen's gambit declined. But in the queen's gambit, normally there's a white bishop on g5, a knight on f6, and this pin is a bit annoying. You're struggling to develop like square bishop. Now you have none of those problems. And just before I let you go and we move on to the next game, one of the key ideas that you want to remember is that this knight is usually ideally placed on the d6 square. So that could be achieved something like knight d7, knight f6, knight e8, knight d6. Just to kind of show you what that would look like. Let's say yeah, white makes some random moves. You get knight on d6. This knight is so good controlling the queen side, controlling the center, getting ready to switch around to the attack. Uh, you can go like bishop f5 next. So, yeah, that's uh, 
nice maneuver to keep in mind for these kind of positions. And other than that, I mean, let me tap myself on the back for that. Bishop d3, knight c6. I do believe that in case of rook takes on b7, long castle is indeed by far the best move. Because your king is actually uh, really safe. And uh, on queen b3, apparently what I was thinking is only the second best move. Apparently it's even stronger if you start with a check and then rook d3. But okay, I mean... From a human perspective, it's much easier to like make the transition uh, into this endgame with two pieces and plenty of pawns uh, for the rook. So, yeah. With that being said, I think we can just move on to the following game. All right, everybody. Another day, another game. Opening goes d4 and uh, we're going to be going for the Grunfeld. We're still chasing those Grunfeld main lines. Okay, knight c3, threatening to play e4. Getting us into the King's Indian, uh, we say no to that, simply because this video is about the Grunfeld and uh, we're gonna push. Are we gonna get CD and then E4 the main line? Please opponent, yes! Opponent, Mr. Vladimir Popovich. 1956, is that his birth year? Jeez. Alright. Alright. That's nostalgia starting to kick in. Okay. BC3, BC3 on the board. So this is the uh, starting position of the Grunfeld. Uh, you want to go bishop to g7, and then you don't want to rush with castle. Once you play bishop g7, you want to start immediately attacking the center with c5. Uh, so normally Fury goes knight f3, c5, and then white has like a big choice between uh, like rook b1, bishop e3, even bishop e2, uh, or like... Uh, you can also play um, sort of bishop c4, c5, and then knight e2. Many main lines, however, my opponent... Whoops. <laughs> however, my opponent played e5. Trying to lock in the bishop! Look at that! Opponent! He wants to kill my Grunfeld before it even started. Alright, c5. I'm just saying, if d c5, I trade queens, and then I'm gonna have a winning endgame. Just because of how vulnerable these pawns are. And okay, f4. Interesting. He's getting me a little bit out of book. I don't like this. Uh, I can play 96, but then the problem is d5. So not super sure how to deal with that. Uh, I can also castle. To me, this strategy is probably going to backfire on the light squares I think I don't know I'm just sort of waiting for him to play knight f3 and then I think bishop g4 is gonna play as a very nice trade I'm trying to debate uh, whether it makes sense to trade and then play bishop g4 I think it kind of makes sense honestly I don't think we can really use the fact that uh, okay maybe some queen a5 move and then cd I don't really see a way for benefiting of that. Perhaps I see a way of going knight c6 d5 and then knight b4. We could benefit from uh, that idea, in fact. So, okay, knight c6 is most normal move. What if bishop e2, bishop g4, bishop e3? Ah, but then knight b4, knight d5 should be comfortable, yeah. So, yeah, this should be good, I think. And if bishop c4, I mean, I should have something nice. Yeah, like bishop f5, threatening some knight c2. Rook c8, yeah, that should be very comfortable. You'll see sort of like a clear case, uh, more of like a classical example of uh, how badly uh, this super aggressive pawn push can backfire for our opponent. Uh, also, this is something more common for the King's Indian, but here it's a nice case as well. So bishop g4, forcing bishop e3, that's one thing. And then uh, I could do knight b4, castle, rook c8 maybe, threatening knight c2. That's annoying for him. I could also do knight b4 uh, right away. Idea being if castle, I could perhaps uh, think of bishop f5 with some knight c2 sort of motifs. Yeah, bishop f5 actually, or knight b4 right away. Maybe preferred, just in this case. Yeah, bishop f5, castle, 
simply knight b4. He's gonna have a very hard time castling, I think. Yep, knight b4. Some light square strategy, I think maybe his best move now is bishop to d2, which is a bit weird. But the point is that maybe knight c2 is not so great because of uh, rook c1. But yeah, on this, I think it's gonna be your turn to pause the video and find the winning move. Yes, that's what I meant to say. So you pause the video and find the winning move if it's not obvious enough. It has to be knight c2 because queen b3 uh, attacks my knight but uh, loses the pawn on d4. Wait, Tempi? Huh. Wait. Maybe losing more. Because if I take... There's bishop e3. But I could take on b1 intermezzo. Give me that. And if he takes my bishop, I take his knight. So if he moves his knight, I keep my bishop. So I'm winning an exchange. Just like that. <laughs> we just did a little trick and... Oh! 96! My opponent is on drugs. No, I'm kidding. It's not a good move, but... Is it that bad? I mean, I could take it simply. I don't really think... I necessarily have better. I should take. He's going to take on b1. Yeah. Then I have like queen d4 check. Queen d4, king h1. And then I was wishing for some tricks like bishop e5. But okay, I don't really have a lot of time in the clock. So I should really speed up. Okay, this is good. This is good. This is good. Wait, is it? Okay, so I was thinking this and then queen d1. I think this should be good. Because like queen d3, maybe I got rook d8. Oh, oh no, queen d3, I just take his bishop. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I saw this in advance. Okay. I knew everything is going to happen exactly like that. And now queen d3 loses the bishop. Unless I'm missing anything. Hmm. That's quite a nice central demolition, I would say. If you are... Looking to get into the Grunfeld. This is exactly the central demolition that uh, <laughs> you are looking for, man. This demolition was worse than uh, <laughs> Romanian government before they started building the House of Parliament. They genuinely demolished like a whole village so that they can build that atrocity. <laughs> This is exactly how uh, we demolished my opponent's center. But okay, he resigns. I mean... This was not Fiori, so I'm not entirely sure of what happened, but it felt like we played natural moves the whole game. And we got a 98! See? I'm not only a pretty face. This was actually a decent game. <laughs> this was actually pretty good, wow. <laughs> My speedrun account may actually get banned just because of how accurate this whole game was. That's pretty crazy. That's pretty crazy. Okay, so Bishop F5, I wasn't really sure. I knew we were like comfortable with many moves really. So castling was fine. Uh, I wasn't sure maybe timing on CD4 was a bit off. I could have taken immediately, but uh, that was fine. And yeah, he had to play bishop d2 in my opinion, although I wasn't sure. No, bishop d2 is still losing, yeah. Bishop d2, same problem like in the game. Uh, the queen interferes the defense of the pawn. Yeah, it's just very bad for my opponent already. Simply because, uh, yeah, he didn't really know much theory and tried to play this sort of uh, e5 kind of logical move, playing against the bishop, but uh, black is doing a great job with this uh, light square uh, strategy and the uh, central demolition. So, yeah, yeah. keep this game uh, in mind. And uh, with that being said, we can move on to the following game. All right, everybody, back with another game. I'm going to play uh, d4 and uh, we're going to go knight f6. We're going to try to stick to the Grunfeld. Going to be playing, uh, hopefully, aggressive chess. Uh, that very much depends on what he's going to do, but uh, he seems to be a c4 boy. Very high chances of a Grunfeld. So uh, the very first moment he wants to do e4, 
Then you want to go uh, for d5, playing the Grunfeld. And uh, let's see what he has ready for us. Hopefully we'll see some main line ideas. Cd5, knight d5, e4. Okay, knight f3. Still possible uh, for main line. Cd5, knight d5, and then e4. He could also play bishop g5, bishop f4, or e3. All are possible moves, but... Uh, h3. 1600, by the way. <sighs> let's just say that my assumption of maybe these guys not having the sharpest anti Grunfeld repertoires wasn't that idiotic so i think we can castle now and then uh, we decide based on what he does he plays e3 so he takes a very cautious approach against the grunfeld now the next move is very important very critical to uh, get uh, decent activity for your pieces in the grunfeld and it's a bit counterintuitive but it's a sacrifice that you need to be able to play uh, whenever your wife wakes you up at 2 a.m in the middle of the night uh you want to be able to see oh yeah yeah no who's texting on your phone uh, it's c5 c5 is texting me right now c5 i gotta play c5 in the grunfeld so that i can activate and then you go back to sleep uh, simply because dc you get queen a5 you're gonna be regaining the pawn and just Opening up uh, the monster bishop uh, is going to give you such a good time in the uh, Grunfeld. So, yeah, c5. In case he does not take, we do want to take and then play knight c6. And a lot of these positions, uh, there is potential that uh, we will be creating an isolated pawn. So, uh, yeah. Trade the pieces, get him into the end game, and... Then when he's isolated pawn, isn't that pretty straightforward? Come on, you guys know this. I, you don't need to me to sit here and explain you the basics. You're here for the good stuff. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Perhaps uh, my opponent was contacted by his own wife and asked about the Grunfeld because he does not seem to have an idea how to deal with it. But okay, there we go. DC5, Queen A5. Standard play. Threatening to take so maybe having some knight e4 ideas you don't want to forget about that as well knight e4 could be a move to really keep on your uh, radar uh, so uh, yeah okay cd5 okay cd5 now this is the kind of position where we can uh, pause for a little bit and think first of all you want to double check whether you have simple tactic knight takes on d5 very thematic idea being if queen takes on d5 you simply Take on c3, and if bc, queen c3, uh, then you're going to be winning the rook. So, after knight d5, queen d5, bishop takes. Can he go bishop d2? That's what you need to ask yourself. Yes, I mean, we have to take, and if queen takes d2, we have queen c5, equal pawns, full equality. Uh, yeah. If he takes with the knight, we have rook d8, and that wins a piece. So apparently knight d5 just works. Alternatively, a move like queen c5 and playing for like long-term compensation is also not too bad. But I think when you see something so clear, uh, you should generally just go for it. Knight e4, bishop d2, and then taking on d2, taking on c5. Here again, some compensation, but mm, not full. I feel like when you can just uh, equalize it. Typical blow, like knight d5. He doesn't even uh, waste time calculating. He's just not happy about it. So I'm going to take and then plan his to Take on c5 eventually and fully equalize in Grunfeld fashion. So see just how easy it is to punish this. Uh, not super standard variations where uh, they don't take on d5. They don't play those like e4 theoretical stuff. Go c5. Open up that damn bishop. And that's how you can easily get a pretty nice uh, dynamic game uh, against uh, d4. Okay, opponent thinking for a little bit. He has many moves, but I guess simply will take. I mean, he can also probably play queen c2, but I have simple move uh, queen takes c5. And I'm going to have a better end game because he will have an uh, isolated pawn on the c file. 
By the way, this brings me uh, flashbacks to a game that I had against uh, Romanian Grandmaster Manolache uh, when I scored, I believe, my second international master norm. I did had a very similar uh, structure because I played Grunfeld against him, knowing that uh, Grandmaster Manolache uh, didn't really like Fury all that much and he was vulnerable on the Grunfeld. Uh, okay, Grunfeld wasn't really my main, but I had some experience with it and I specifically targeted his repertoire and it worked really well. I mean, I had a minus one with black almost after the opening with black against Grandmaster. So that is very rare. And uh, it was a position like this where I took on C3 and he had the weak pawn in that game. Uh, you know, <laughs> maybe because I was crapping my pants, I couldn't really uh, fully uh, convert this advantage. But maybe we can do a better time here against Mr. Braden. Uh I mean, no pressure though, you shouldn't really think in terms of winning, you just want to keep improving your positions and if the chance shows, you want to take it. Okay, I'm thinking knight c6, but maybe with the brain that I have right now, I could delay that and prioritize rook c8. I don't know why, but I got a feeling this could be a bit more annoying for him. Because knight c6, I'm gonna have to spend a bit more time until I get to attack the pawn. And also knight d4 is not super clear how to play against. So maybe just bishop d7 could also be very idiotic, but it looks clever for me in the moment. Uh, I want to do rook c8, very next move. It's kind of sophisticated way of playing. You generally don't have to come up with uh, such deep ideas, but... Yeah, on rook b1, for instance, simply b6 and knight e5. Yeah, I think I'm quite happy if he trades because he speeds up uh, my development. And uh, even though, uh, yes, bishops are, uh, you know, should be valued over knights, uh, I think it's more important in this position that I get to develop and uh, attack that uh, pawn on c3. And something like bishop c4, okay, shouldn't really be that scary. I have at least bishop e8. The bishop is doing a great job defending f7 or I can simply play uh, e6 as well. So then he's going to be left with a bunch of loose pieces. Uh, maybe, yeah, I'm not sure which one is best, honestly. Maybe bishop e8 simply on bishop c4. Um, yeah, okay, bishop c4. I'm going to go to, to bishop e8. I want to teach you guys about not being ashamed to play bishop e8 when it's not blocking your rooks. This is such a cool maneuver. It's actually such a cozy place for the bishop. You don't even feel like the bishop is in the room. You know, it's like that elephant uh, in the coffee shop that it's almost invisible. So, uh, bishop d5, targeting the pawn. I don't really have much of an alternative. Uh, I can stay passive and play rook c7, but generally the best moves in chess are attacking. Passive means red flag. You want to be more aggressive, so the other alternative that's aggressive is knight c6. Threatening to take the knight, so he has to take, and then we take with the bishop. Sure, I mean, we do get some trades, uh, but on the other hand, uh, we do get to activate the rooks, and then we will be able to pile up even more pressure on uh, c3. So... <clears throat> Okay, this is starting to look better and better. I'm getting quite excited about this uh, this game. If I manage to win it, I will just think about it as I managed to convert uh, <laughs> that end game from five years ago against Grandmaster Manolake. I will just think of it uh, that way in my brain. Also, funny thing, if that happened, I would have gotten a Grandmaster in arm. But I failed uh, to win in the last round, so... I'm mentioning this because it's the only time uh, I played for a norm. So it's not like every day that happens. So takes, takes, bishop takes, rook takes. I want to take with a rook. I mean, if e4, I'm going to force it. Yeah, okay, so c4, he's doing like a clever attempt. If I'm trading on d5, that's going to uh, get his pawn structure like together. But uh, yeah, notice that uh, I can simply play e6. And these uh, pawns are completely to separate uh, pawn islands here. After e6, he has to trade. And yeah, simply take with a rook. And uh, notice that this pawn on c4 is yeah, an isolated pawn island here that we can attack. It's almost as bad as the Epstein island. So we're just going to be 
immediately deleting that of the map by playing rook c8 and we are going to be taking that pawn now does this mean the end game is going to be an easy win hell no it's a rook end game however does this improve our situation uh yes it does so we're going to be taking that pawn and normally from my experience uh whenever you get these sort of small victories most of the opponents uh, are just gonna defend way worse than normal so you have a very good chance that your advantage uh, starts snowballing slowly so okay b6 defending my opponent next i could uh, play h5 yeah so in a lot of these positions he should be willing to uh, win space somehow because it's very important in this rook end game okay this is getting a bit more advanced stuff so if you're a beginner try to like uh remember some of these ideas but this is not gonna be the fact that it's gonna jump your rating by like hundreds of points maybe like 50 points only right now but it's gonna help you when you get better because you want to sort of uh dominate both sides on the board so i want to make sure that he's not pushing and Quite often, you even go ahead and play uh, g5, g4 and try to squeeze him. Also, I should bring my king sooner or later. So I think I'll start doing it now. Or I could even play g5. Oh man, I don't want to mess up this endgame. It can be so instructive. Yeah, I think g5 is nice. I need to make sure that I'm not getting my pawns uh, <laughs> just uh, taken by my opponent. But I have rook c5 at the very least. So it's super important that uh, you are taking space, you're using your rook to keep pressure, and then you should also bring the king. And somehow all these elements combined are gonna slowly uh, get you to the win. Otherwise the win is a bit difficult to achieve uh, just by trying to push these pawns. So, okay, I think I'm gonna go like maybe h4, fix the pawns. So he's gonna do king d3, but then rook a4 simply should be chilling. Yeah. I'm not super sure whether I was supposed to bring my king first. That would have been like the more intuitive thing to do. But I just felt like I should take this opportunity of taking space. Otherwise, it may not be there anymore. I feel like I could bring my king anytime later. So this felt like a pri priority to me. Yeah, okay, so maybe now f6 simply. King d2 not doing anything, just f6, and now it's time to bring the king. So notice this is kind of like an ideal position for the pawns. Just because, uh, oh man, do I want to play uh, e5 even? No, not really. No need to rush, I mean I can do it anytime. But basically these pawns at some point can be targets as well. So like, if somehow I manage to trade uh, these pawns for that pawn, I can use my rook and switch towards attacking those. That would be like a simple idea. It doesn't look very logical right now. I know, but you should have a bit of patience until that happens. So I'm just going to optimize my king now. So step one, squeeze him on the other side of the board. Come on, opponent, you are not supposed to do that. Now I can simply take and it's going to be the easiest win of all time. But for educational purposes, I'm going to keep uh, rooks. I want to make this more uh, instructive. I want to bring my king and hopefully he's not going to like continuously offer a rook trade. <laughs> because trading into a king opponent game is the most suicidal thing that you can do in such position. Uh, as white, even at the risk of losing the second pawn, you should aim to um, keep uh, your rook. You know, it's the only source of counterplay, the only thing that keeps you alive. The only bottle of water that you have in the Sahara Desert. So, I don't know how much that's going to help and for how long, but it's a little bit of something. So, King d6. I want to maybe check and then King c5. Activate further. Also could consider maybe King d5, because King d3, Rook c1 is interesting, with the idea to start uh, harassing the pawns from behind. Yeah, now it's getting uh, into the more interesting part. Perhaps my ideal place for the rook would be if I manage to get uh, king d5, king d3, rook, rook c1. Actually, the winning idea may be rook a1. Because if I get to play rook a2, my opponent is unable to defend. And he keeps plundering into this rook d5. Give me a break. Oh, God. Opponent. 
I want to win it without that idea. It's too obvious. But okay, I guess if my opponent really wants to, I'm going to show you the idea of just winning with the rook trade. But I think we are getting uh, close to that, showing... Uh, Okay, I'm just forcing him to activate my king, could have taken as well. But yeah, that idea of getting rook c1 and then getting the rook to a2, I think would have been uh, the last nail in the coffin uh, converting this endgame. But yeah, okay, we just take. It was always kind of a risk-free uh, position. I think quite interesting was bishop d7, rook c8 to put pressure on c3 quickly. Not playing that kind of uh, move by hand, nice c6 early to develop, but yeah, now just gonna be simple. Uh, anything that you do, I think I'm just gonna start a5 and then b5. This is actually one of the most instructive king and pawn end games uh, that you can get because it shows exactly why uh, having a, uh, an extra pawn in king and pawn end games is just winning. Mm. I can do b5. The easier move is king d4, and I'm winning the second pawn. Notice that he's running out of squares, but also b5 is winning. After something like uh, king a3, a4. This one's particularly even nicer. I'm going to play b5. It's not as good as the other one, but uh, it's still good enough, so I'm going to show it. This is beautiful because we're going to checkmate with the rook promotion. Uh, I mean, wait and you'll see how it happens. It's quite beautiful. Um... Uh, we're basically going to get his king into the corner and I'm going to get him in what it looks to be a stalemate position. However, it is not going to be a stalemate position. <laughs> He's going to have these uh, moves for the pawns. So, yeah. This is textbook stuff. Uh, yeah. He's going to go into the corner hoping for the stalemate. There it goes. Stalemate position. And then, uh, yeah. He's going to go f4 and I'm going to take with a g pawn. Come on, opponent, do something, yeah. Now he has to play this pawn. Only move, legal. And then, uh, okay, I mean, I could take, but uh, yeah, I just want to push. He pushes, I push, and then I'm going to promote to a rook, yeah. And by magic, da -da -da -da, <laughs> we get the checkmate. Okay. All right. Quite nice. This is a game that I'm actually pretty happy about. Let's pop the game review and start crying about the evaluation together. Okay, I mean, 93, considering that I've purposely, purposefully avoided that rook trade like twice, it's actually a pretty good rating. 93, not bad, not bad. So we use this typical trick, I mean, just 95 to win back the pawn. I mean, we kind of calculated this together, that bishop c3, bishop d2. Uh, oh, apparently even rook d8 is better here. I was just uh, going to play this and have equal game, but uh, even rook d8 uh, was working. I miss the fact that I have queen c3 intermediate moves, and this time we managed to also ruin his pawn structure, and uh, black is slightly better, like, in the game. So yeah, I'm specifically curious whether bishop d7 was clever. So I played the simple chess. And okay, bishop d7 is quite a decent move. I mean, it's out there. It's not like the best, not the worst. So rook c8, yeah, and then bishop e8. This was very smart, actually. And then knight c6 and everything was, uh, yeah, textbook play in the rook endgame. So okay. Quite uh, quite nice uh, Grunfeld uh, introduction. Uh, if you ask me, uh, I will just uh, remember this as uh, if I won the game against Grandmaster Manolaki, despite the fact that I was playing against an opponent that's 1600 only. So with that being said, I think we can just move on to the following game. Right, everybody, at the, your request, we're going to be Grunfelding. We're going to be going Knight of Six. What are the odds that they play the London? No London. Going to go G6, and the idea is to meet Knight C3, not with the standard Bishop G7, but uh, to play the move D5, no longer allowing White to build up that uh, huge center of pawns. So... Uh, this is a bit of a different uh, strategy, and with a bit I mean uh, a much more different strategy. 
White has a variety of setups. The main line is to take. They can also play more positional, like knight f3, bishop g5, or bishop f4. Where, um, yeah, just want to play bishop g7. And uh, generally, you want to meet this by castling and then playing c5. Because on dc5, you get a lot of dynamics with uh, queen a5 kind of move, pinning him. Um, then you regain the spawn, you take on c4, knight goes to c6, bishop g4, and okay, black is um, quite solid without uh, much complications. Okay, c5, bad move alert. <laughs> c5, not so good, but also not so obvious to refute. Uh, I think uh, we just develop, and then um, the thing with this is it can probably just become a target to b6 at the right moment. I want to get castled before uh, I embark on uh, any uh, goofy excursions. Wait, is that a word? Uh, anyways, I meant to say uh, on any goofy uh, operations. Yeah, I don't know. My choice of words uh, today is uh, interesting to say the least. Open and place normal move. E3. Uh, oh. Right, this is kind of puzzling me because in the Grunfeld, the main idea is to play c5 and we can no longer do it. Uh, okay. Well, I'm thinking about knight c6. It's not so common because normally they have pressure in the center, so you want to play this. But because he no longer attacks the pawn on d5, I'm thinking knight c6 makes sense. The only thing that we need to be ready for is if they start to have this kind of uh, Jubava London ideas, like knight b5, targeting c7. But I do believe we have a very cunning pawn sacrifice with e5. Can we go e5 there? After the pawn takes. There is at the very least knight e4, attacking c5. Yep, that should be good. That should be the play. Uh, okay, in uh, other uh, ideas, knight f3, bishop g4, followed by uh, takes, and then uh, yeah, slowly preparing e5, should be good. I hope he doesn't play knight b5, but if he does, it's going to be quite a juicy refutation. Okay, h3, so he just wants knight f3 without me getting in contact with his uh, knight. His knight is taken. It's a monogamous knight. We shall not get in contact with him. Not on Bimol Kids Watch from Saudi Arabia. That rings a bell. Uh, okay. H3. So, this would be a thing. But another kind of typical Grunfeld idea would be 9d7. It looks like we are just hanging the pawn on d5. We kind of are. But we are preparing e5. And then after the e5, the knight takes. Yeah, it's kind of crucial to open up the bishop. I really feel like knight d7 is one of the best uh, moves in this position. As an alternative, knight h5 is there. But that is uh, kind of misplacing the knight. So yeah, knight d7. I think best move according to the computer. And I swear I am not cheating. And I am preparing e5. Just because uh, this is such a typical idea in the Jobava London, uh, when you're facing the Grunfeld, a lot of the times the only way for black to equalize is to play this very weird knight d7 that, uh, technically speaking, nobody knows about. Because, um, yeah, you just sack the pawn just because of how much more important the activity really is. I think. We'll see. <laughs> e5. Uh, yeah, if takes, we have an interesting opportunity to take on c5. Uh, okay, but he just goes bishop g5. Uh, probably best move is just to take and then go bishop e6. And you have these typical Grunfeld bishops that are uh, kind of uh, snipering the enemy queen side. But on bishop to g5. Mm, yeah, our first instinct is just f6. Keeping up the momentum, bishop h4, and then come up with something. Uh, maybe for 92, and then we need to protect the pawn. 
97 kind of a move and we managed to build up a nice center that's ready to be supported with uh, c6 and we also have ideas to play knight f5 and use that bishop as a target so i think f6 it's already uh, clear advantage for black move nine in the Grunfeld. uh okay against pretty strong uh, player i mean 20 green pretty strong for you guys uh, okay, e4, attacking the knight. The knight has to move. And then I'm going to have to defend my pawn with the only move on the board. Okay, this is not too hard, guys. You can come up with this. Uh, I don't want to play this because that would make me look weird. So I will just defend. Okay, there is one key idea that I may have missed. Yeah, queen b3 is very clever. So... I was thinking uh, that maybe there is simple move like c6 to be played. But then I realized that uh, we're actually also pinned. So queen b3 is a double attack threatening uh, knight x on e4 as well. So my opponent is cooking something here. Huh. Wow. That's pretty wild. Uh, okay. Am I like lost already? Move 12 in the Grunfeld. So let's calculate that. I believe I can still play c6, knight takes on e4, say something like knight f5, bishop has to go back to g3, I can unpin, the knight has to move because I'm no longer pinned, say he goes to d6, I'm going to take the bishop so that I'm weakening his position, then I can play queen e7 targeting the e3 pawn. And I think we have pretty good compensation because any king f2 move can be met by bishop h6. I mean, yes, he will have rook e1, but I guess his position is still maybe a bit better there. Hmm. Tricky, tricky, tricky. I gotta play c6. There's really no other way uh, around it. Expecting knight d takes on e4. Otherwise, we're just much better after king h8 and uh, like... Knight f5. Maybe actually I'm just preparing to play knight f5 that way. No need to play the prophylactic uh, king move. Knight f5 is just such a huge threat. Mm. So yeah. Can also play maybe g4 to stop it, but then I may yeah, play the preventive move. Okay, knight f5. So this is going to be pretty forcing. Has to go bishop g3. I could go rook e8. Rook e8 may be clever. Just because when the knight goes back home, we have knight d4 ideas also taking advantage of the pin. Problem is rook e8, knight d6. It's kind of forcing me to trade, isn't it? Because knight d4, he can maybe just go queen d1. Uh, yeah. Tricky, tricky, tricky. Hmm. Yes, I think unpinning was probably still the best uh, thing we can do. And uh, so far we have managed to predict, but uh, it looks like I may have miscalculated. So I said this and then rook eight. I forgot that the knight can take. So that was just completely ludicrous of me to think. But uh, there's also queen e7. Can I move? Yeah, gotta go for it. Really no better options uh, at this point. Uh, can you sell another bishop h6? Mm. Yeah. Bishop h6, king f2. Not super sure what the bishop does there anymore. Queen e7 feels like a... Certainly a uh, useful move. Has to play king f2 now, clearly. Otherwise, he's going to have troubles with the pawn. And many interesting ideas. I was kind of having a quick look on 95, thinking to sack the piece and maybe open up the rook. But he does not have to accept it. So 95, kind of pointless in that regard. To be completely honest, I could actually just wake up here and say, okay, yes, you got the extra pawn, but you have plenty of weaknesses and also c5 is a bit of an, uh, 
overextended move so i could start uh, questioning him with stuff like b6 and honestly that may be one of the best things we could play for completely undermining his position knight d1 is a bad move though it's retreating and he's still under the pin um but yeah i think b6 is a good move now yes we are down a pawn but we uh we got many weaknesses to play for we have a development uh, advantage so just think of that knight c8 rook c8 i'm gonna have all my pieces developed already while he still has uh, coordination issues now oh, the knight is hanging has to take on c8 otherwise uh, he may uh, suffer uh, huge material losses okay takes rook takes equal pawns I am just uh, having a much better position now simply because uh, his pieces are more passive and his position is full of targets I can take simply because we are uh, exploiting the pin he cannot trade capture and uh, okay for the first time in the game we are having an extra pawn uh, he is targeting my rook I'm gonna move my rook and get a tempo I think here alternative was that but then he can simply uh, Re-establish material equality and uh, maybe I had uh, knight c5 but queen a3 could have pinned me so yeah, I wouldn't have uh, won the bishop. So simple move here I think was better. Mm. Okay, maybe queen c2 now. Time to do that but I can kind of cash in another pawn because queen c6. Uh, I got forking ideas. I also have uh, queen c6, rook b6 on the radar. <laughs> maybe that actually just wins the bishop. Yeah, that actually wins the bishop. Spoiler alert. Queen c6 is not a good move. Yeah, rook e1, trying to like win this, but I can keep these pawns together. Just look how uh, his knight doesn't have any squares right now, because it's completely restricted by my pawns, and uh, if I even manage to play c5, that is going to be quite tragic for my opponent. I don't think he can really stop it. For the same tactical reason, queen c6, rook b6 should still be completely winning, I think. Um, he has queen c4 there as a new move, but shouldn't really change much. Uh, and yeah, I'm just going to play c5. Simple chess, no need to calculate, just to <laughs> get these pawns made. I I'm just like randomly building a skyscraper in front of his house. I'm like completely restricting his view right now. Like, look at his pieces, <laughs> you know? This is why they invented the air tax these days. So you don't get such pawns for free. Um, I'm going to go 95, just activating. Man, this is so sad. Imagine I start playing g5, f5, f4. Maybe it's not required, but we're going to play just for the sake of it. Screw this. Oh, no, he's trying to undermine me. He's trying to undermine my skyscraper. I should have played a5. Don't you dare to play b4, opponent. This is a piece of art right here. If we play g5, f4. Oh no. <laughs> he, took, he really wants to undermine my skyscraper, doesn't he? I mean, we can't really blame him, but we do have an extra piece with a completely winning position. We just need to uh, now unpin. Can I do queen d6? Just unpinning. Rook d1. Oh, I have less than a minute. I can also unpin and gain a tempo, so usually uh, keeping the tempo is the best move, so gonna do that instead, um, preparing just to trade and then maybe win another pawn, that should be pretty simple. On the rookie one, I'm just gonna play a nice little trick to show you guys uh, why Grunfeld is so tactical and potentially nice. Because we can go for something that you can try to find by pausing the video. But, yeah. Rook takes b2. If he takes, I have knight f3, fork. I mean, check, and then I win the queen. That's one thing. I also have, uh, yeah, knight c4. Which is also, like, not bad. Not bad at all. Probably even better, honestly. Yeah, even better because, ooh, I get uh, something nice at the end. I may still get his queen after this because i take and then there's gonna be bishop d4 pin so uh yeah ruby 2 he doesn't have to like really take it but would you go 
completely passive queen c1. You can't tell me that you're playing such move with a happy face. Say, I'm just gonna do this. I think it's easiest. Just getting a rook and then bishop d4 will pin, so even winning more material than it looks like <laughs> initially. Got only 40 seconds, but uh, honestly should be plenty, considering that he will be uh, left with the king alone very soon. So, yeah, 93. He cannot really recapture. Uh, and uh, here, just a trick for you guys to uh, completely make your conversion easier. Don't go bishop d4, because he can kind of still keep queens, but force it. So sacrifice a little bit, but then you get to exchange his last piece and uh, the good news is that uh, when he only has the king uh, left on the board you cannot really lose can you so the rest should be pretty simple just take and now i'm gonna activate my rook i have to like uh, pick up these pawns oops yeah pick up all pawns take it's nice to like eliminate all his pawns uh, because even if you lose on time, you have at least a draw. If he has uh, only one pawn left on the board, that's enough to give him a win. So I'm just going to be taking, then I'm going to cut his king. I'm going to place my rook on a defended square and then we're going to be promoting. Okay, just doing a little bit of pre-moves and then uh, we are just gonna be using uh, one of the most basic techniques to deliver checkmate which is called the uh, staircase essentially uh, the rook is cutting this king and we're just gonna try to like uh, get this mechanism of queen next to the rook and uh, okay notice how queen cuts this line and you just do move the pieces like this and it's gonna be force mate so rook is uh, keeping the king in this box, in the queen. Queen is yet again keeping him uh, tied down. Now we seal the deal, just in time. Okay, why is this game actually total nonsense? Let's have a look. Mm. Okay, got a 92. <laughs> not bad, not bad. Uh, it was kind of interesting, like the way he played, queen to b3. I have to be honest, I haven't uh, like fully expected that, but our moves, on the other hand, uh, were kind of natural, I felt like. All right, everybody, uh, getting a black game. This time, uh, playing in the blitz pool, just because um, it's a bit easier to find the game this way, and uh, I'm going to be trying the Grunfeld. It seems that my opponent plays uh, d4, c4. Uh, I'm going to go bishop g7 now. Notice that typical mistake here for Grunfeld beginners would be d5. Because after cd, knight d5, e4, you basically no longer have uh, knight x on c3. So means you're going to be stuck with an extra piece on the board in a position with less space, which really matters. Okay, so we're just going to play bishop d7 and basically uh, on knight c3, yeah, now that white is threatening e4, forcing us to play the King's Indian, we're gonna say no to that. Not because it's a bad opening, but because we want to play Grunfeld, we want to play more dynamic. So we're gonna take with a knight, e4 is now uh, the best move for them. Notice how taking uh, may look like uh, it's interesting for why, developing uh, our queen early in the center. However, the queen is actually a very well-placed piece there, simply because my opponent has no way to actually attack it, so for this reason e4 is better, we're gonna take it now. Do not rush uh, with castle, because maybe uh, some bishop a3 could be annoying, or uh, anyways, it's just more accurate to meet bc with c5. That is the typical uh, Grunfeld move. So you take on c3, and then you immediately start attacking the center with pawns. Now white has, of course, uh, many moves, bishop e3, rook b1, bishop e2, uh, so, okay, we see bishop e3. Rook b1 is quite an interesting variation because uh, after castle, they normally want to play uh, d5. And white is basically sacrificing c3, but they get very interesting uh, development. So, uh, my opponent plays bishop to e3 instead. On a move such as uh, rook b1 here, uh, you can go for uh, takes and then uh, queen a5, win that pawn on a2, 
lots of fury there. Uh, that and Zina throw. <laughs> but on Bishop P3, I quite like to start with Queen A5, uh, sort of forcing him to make a decision. Uh, White can make many moves. I think Queen D2 is the main. Uh, okay, Queen B3, that's not it. <laughs> so Queen A5 not only attacking this pawn, but also pinning it. Because after uh, Queen to B3, uh, I can take and notice that he's unable to keep the center anymore. So he's going to be left with a pretty weak pawn on C3. Now I have a decision between taking activating his knight or castling. So I see no reason why I should activate his knight, so I won't. And okay, I mean, we just got a very easy uh, equality with the Grunfeld. I would say even slightly better because we have that pawn that uh, we can play for. It's an isolated pawn. Not really doing much with this queen b2 move. Uh, just, uh, I guess, prophylactic. We're going to develop knight c6 and then perhaps bishop d4. Typical way uh, to develop. Um, notice that queen b7 is uh, not working due to queen c3. And now we need to think uh, for like a little bit. Because he may be uh, trying to take that pawn on b7. I could play simple move like b6, placing my pawns uh, on the dark squares when I have the light square bishop. So that's uh, I think quite nice strategically and after knight d4. Yeah, simply taking should be good. I think he's forced to recapture with the knight. Otherwise... Uh, on queen e2, I think uh, we would have had queen c3. And also, like, knight takes. I have at the very least queen c5 as a move. So, yeah, he takes. And we just have a uh, slightly better but risk-free endgame that we can play forever. So I'm just going to bring rooks to the open files, I think. Rook fd8 is going to play rook d1. And then I think perhaps I can try to improve possession of my queen, queen c5. Okay, so he goes knight d4 instead. I should definitely not take because that's improving his pawn structure. So I think I'm just going to do queen c5, threatening to win a pawn. Okay, that was a bit, a bit uh, rushed by him. My opponent... Uh, see, this is kind of a typical example of somebody who does not know a very important grandmaster secret, which is... Pawns do not move backwards. Notice how he played these high dopamine moves. Like, he checked me and then uh, he realized that, oh, the pawns are weak. If you play queen e2, defending, I have rook d4. Winning a pawn by force. So yeah, now I'm just going to take. I got a minute on the clock, which is not uh, such a huge amount of time. But we have simple moves now. Just rooks onto the open file. Offering a queen trade pretty soon. Yeah, I think queen d3. Or queen c5 even. Just uh, preparing to switch places with the rook. Slowly infiltrating. So, yeah. I just want to double up. Maybe rook d3, maybe pick up the a-pawn. In an ideal world, uh, there could have been a potential trick. With maybe take on h2 and some mating ideas but uh, not anymore since now we're heading towards the end game notice that i'm gradually simply improving the position of my pieces not really anything sophisticated and uh, because we have an extra pawn and he's got plenty of targets this just kind of speaks for itself uh, on how you should do it here again i do not take i just bring the other rook threatening to take and now we have two pawns extra so Gonna start pushing. Gonna bring my king. Okay, f6, maybe not a move that I really had to play. Perhaps that was, yeah, just a mistake because now he gets to check me. Okay, I messed up. <laughs> Rook a4. I forgot that uh, he can win the uh, a7 pawn with checks, which is unfortunate because the game was. Quite clean this far. Okay, he's trying to mate me. I don't want to be mated. Yeah, at this point I should just push C3 probably. And he's going to have to give me the A-pawn. 
and I'm gonna get my rook behind. So with two extra points, should be completely winning. But because I only have six seconds on the clock, I don't know what to think about this. I'm just gonna push. He has to stay with King G2. Oh, he's doing typical mistake now. He's gonna go after the pawn, allowing me to win his rook. Yeah. Probably not gonna be in time to convert, just because I was uh, a bit of a slow brain. I got like 18 moves to make, which is, uh, yeah, quite plenty. But okay, at this point, it's just a matter of uh, <laughs> good luck if we <laughs> if we make it. Oh, he resigned. That was nice of him. Quite a nice gentleman sign. So 